What happens when the largest automobile manufacturer in the world insults a relatively tiny Japanese auto manufacturer? Well, they get taken out behind the proverbial woodshed and embarrassed publicly. Welcome back to All Cars, y'all. I am John, and in 1973, the CEO of GM insulted Honda, and Honda responded by embarrassing them publicly as well as in front of regulators and almost the president. This story actually has entered into almost urban legend and built the legend, helped build the legend of what was the Japanese auto manufacturing of the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. But the fact is, is that the story we've heard isn't exactly true. Now I'll tell you the story, but then we're gonna step back and kind of paint the picture of how we got to that moment. The story is this, is that Honda had come out at the dawn of the EPA regulations regarding emissions around cars. And while American manufacturers were strapping on catalytic converters and air blowers and exhaust gas recirculating valves, Honda went and designed their CVCC engine and proceeded to crush the EPA standards not only for the coming year, but the future years up there, I believe 1976. GM CEO was asked about it, and he said, well, a disparaging comment I'll tell you a little bit later. Honda bought a Chevy with this big honkin' V8 engine, had his engineers design and install a CVCC system to the top of a GM engine, and then sent it back to the EPA for testing. Now, the way the urban legend goes is that it crushed every test, including future tests, while increasing the gas mileage of this Chevy Impala. Unfortunately, the story's not quite true the way it's been told. So let's roll back the clocks a little bit. And in the 60s, there was an increasing concern around smog. Industrialized nations around the world were looking into ways to do it. And the EPA was setting standards to take effect in the mid 70s, requiring auto manufacturers to get certain chemicals coming out of the tailpipe under control. But this threw the industry into turmoil because nobody really knew how to do it. First off is they weren't really clear on what was causing smog. Number two, if you think about the vast array of very large cars with heavy platforms and big V8 engines in most cases, very, very expensive and time consuming to re-engineer new platforms, smaller engines and switch to more fuel efficient technologies. Honestly, we can look back now and see that it took about 10 to 15 years for them to downsize everything. But more importantly is no one really knew how to address the concerns of the tailpipe emissions. Catalytic converters had been used in industrial capacities, but never in something where it actually was strapped to a car that would move and bounce around and things like that. And they didn't really know how to address some of the other issues. Most of these emissions come from the fact that the fuel mixture inside the cylinder has a little too much fuel in it, so you end up with unburned particulates that are coming out of the rear of the tailpipe. Also remember, this is when we had a huge gas crisis, the first of two in the 70s, and so Americans were really looking to improve their fuel efficiency. So what the big three ended up doing is, number one, lobbying the president, saying they couldn't meet the coming standards and they needed a delay. They also ended up working on catalytic converter technology, the lowered the compression of the engines, as well as other solutions that ended up sapping power out of these engines. It worked, but it made the cars worse to drive. But over at Honda, they took a different approach. Now, Sochirio Honda himself was a very, very talented engineer and had built Honda up literally from a shack making engines for bicycles to the largest manufacturer of motorcycles in the world and then an auto manufacturer. But at the time they started investigating air pollution, they were only running two-stroke engines. They ended up having to use engines from other manufacturers to do the experiments on while they were developing the technology and developing their own engine. He tasked his engineers with studying not only engine technologies, but at that point, also what was causing smog. Now, Honda had established an independent research center in 1960 for auto technologies, and he organized a 10-person air pollution research group in 1965. Now, other manufacturers were looking not only at ways to, to add on to their existing engines, but other engine technologies. 
famously, Mazda looked at the rotary engine. Infamously, GM was looking at the rotary engine, and Ford was actually looking at a similar solution to what Honda was working on. Honda decided that they didn't want to abandon the internal combustion four-stroke engine. So they began to look back in the past at what technologies had been researched before, as well as how diesel engines actually worked. And they came up with a simple yet innovative solution, the CVCC, the Compound Vortex Controlled Combustion. Now, in short, it revised the head for an engine and moved the spark plug and one air inlet to a small pre-combustion chamber. This would ignite a very rich fuel mixture and spread the combustion to the area where a leaner mixture with less fuel awaited. This allowed a more complete burning of the fuel without lowering compression or using other more expensive and unreliable options such as fuel injection. The Ford solution was very similar. This is called a stratified charge. Ford was working on it, but they were using a fuel injector and in their tests, it had turned out to be very unreliable and not durable at all and they forecast that it would not be ready for about 10 years or about 1980. Honda's solution meant that they could actually keep their existing tooling without having to redo all the tooling, say for a Wankel rotary engine. And in fact, they could use a modified carburetor to provide an extra barrel, provide that fuel over to that pre-combustion chamber. The results ended up being absolutely astounding where Honda could meet the new EPA standards without converters, air pumps, EGRs, or anything else as well as meeting those future standards. In fact, after introducing this in the early 70s, Honda used it into the 80s on their cars, although they did end up adding catalytic converters along the way. It was so simple that since existing engines could be used but with modified heads, many auto manufacturers licensed the technology. Toyota, Ford, Chrysler, and Isuzu all eventually licensed Honda's technology to use in their own cars. But notably, GM passed on it. Now, when the CEO, Richard Gerstenberg, was asked about whether he was aware of it or not, he actually said, well, I have looked at this design, and while it might work on some little toy motorcycle engine, I see no potential for it in one of our GM cars. Well, it got a little bit worse than that because, so while Ford had been working on a similar technology since 1960, Honda's 1972 CVCC engine passed all of the upcoming 1975 regulations, proving that it could be done at a time when the industry and their lobbyists were arguing that the standards could not be met. In fact, Ford sent a letter to the National Academy of Sciences in January of 1973 pointing out that the performance data for the CVC was only for light vehicles. They felt that it would not be adapted to big V8s, that the carburetor action might limit the capacity for vacuum accessories, that it would lower fuel economy, that it would use up to 25% more fuel with a 25% drop in power output, less torque, and one of the big reasons was that the CVCC engine, Honda had a very small bore while these big V8s had much, much larger bores, and it just, it just wouldn't work. And that's when GM made their comment. Now, I think it's important to note just how tiny Honda was at this time. By 1969, they were only selling a few hundred thousand cars, and again, were still developing their first four-stroke engine. One of the things that engineers from the big three brought up was that their overhead valve technology was more easily adaptable versus the pushrod technology that most of the big three engines were using at the time. So after GM's comment, Honda eventually, Mr. Honda himself heard about this, and he had a 1973 Chevy Impala with a 350 cubic inch engine purchased and air freighted over to Japan, where he instructed his engineers to add the CVCC technology to it. Remember, this still just used a carburetor. They worked on it and they sent it back to the EPA. Now, depending on what you read, the urban legend is, is that it passed every single one of the standards for the three different outputs at the tail, tailpipe, while also having a marginal increase in the fuel economy of the car. Well, again, 
I looked at the data and it's not quite that crystal clear. But there's a second part of this that I never knew about, which is Honda actually did this twice. They actually got a 140 cubic inch four cylinder GM Vega and shipped it and had it retrofitted with CBCC technology when they sent it back to the EPA. The Vega could meet every single one of the federal emission standards for 1975 with a 9% fuel economy improvement. And remember, this does not have any EGR catalysts or air pumps attached to it. But let's go back and talk about the Impala and actually what the results were. Now the first thing to note is, is that the Impala had a problem on the second hot start, actually, after it had already been running, but they found out that what was happening is apparently the float was sticking in that secondary barrel of the carburetor that was feeding the pre-combustion chamber. It was easily addressed and it could pass afterwards, except that Honda couldn't leave the car there to have it run through the EPA test results again. But when looking at hydrocarbons, the CVCC engine, 350 cubic inch Impala engine, beat the stock 350 dramatically at every single speed. Not a surprise there. Now for carbon monoxide, it also beat the stock 350, but for nitrous oxides, for NOxes, it actually did slightly worse the faster you went. Once you reached about 30 miles an hour, the CVCC was actually emitting more than the stock 350 engine. And the same for CO2, for carbon dioxide. It was emitting more. And looking at the data, the fuel economy here in table three, you've got it up on the screen right now, this 350 CVCC was slightly worse in gas mileage than that stock 350 at every single location. So what's been fascinating to me is, is that this story has been told over and over and over again that it crushed the EPA regulations and also improved fuel economy, but that's not quite true. For the Vega, it apparently did. I cannot find the test results from the EPA for that Vega, but for the Impala, it's not quite true. It actually got slightly worse, and from that perspective, I think GM's engineers were correct. Maybe they overstated the case just a little bit. But the end result was is that this test being done showing what was a more cost effective way to improve an engine versus all of the other stuff that the big three were gonna be strapping onto the car actually embarrassed them. And at a time when Honda was such a tiny manufacturer, they were putting more money into research and development than Toyota and Nissan, which were both two of the largest companies in Japan building autos at the time. Honda proved themselves as an innovative engineering company that could do anything and the big three were once again just saying no to regulation instead of actually making the hard decisions to make it work. And what stands out to me is that Ford with their system, their Proco system, they'd already been working on it for 10 years, still couldn't get it to work and thought it was gonna be another seven to 10 years before they could roll it out really helped prove the legend of the sharp engineering minds and careful manufacturing of what the Japanese were doing. A fantastic urban legend, and I love a good one that embarrasses GM and shows them to be lying to the public and to regulators and to the president in this case. But unfortunately, the story is not exactly the way we've always heard it. Thanks for being here, guys. I appreciate it.